Mark Erin Rust is one of the most reviled men in South Australia. Mark Rust began his life as a sex pest, elevated himself to a predator, and then became a serial killer. He would rape, he would kill. His victims, always women. They're clearly disposable to him. They're there for contempt, to be used and discarded. He'd already murdered once when he targeted a vulnerable Japanese student. And when asked by an Adelaide psychologist why did he kill Megumi, he simply replied, uh, because I did. What or who would stop Mark Erin Rust? A killer brazen enough to report his own crime to the police. Yeah, there's uh, someone hanging around the old uh, plane and police station. Uh, can you think we uh, probably uh, break in there, okay? Mark Rust's at first irritating perversion was just the beginning of 30 years of escalating violence against women. With Rust, one thing always leads to another. Mark Rust is a man whose violence began very early in life because it was untreated, because it was not seen by authorities, because it was ignored by those in power. It escalated and worsened to the point where he became a remorseless killer. There was no way Maya Jakic could know about Rust's sordid life the night that she unwillingly encounters him. Maya was walking along a road in Paynham, east northeast of the city, one night, and at the time Rust was a taxi driver. He was driving around looking for a fare to pick up. He saw Maya, pulled up close to her, still running, and said, how about a lift? Maya dismissed him. Perhaps she feels safe. There were lots of cars on the road. Surely this little man was no threat. Either way, Maya was in no mood for small talk. Maya ignored him and continued to walk on. His rejection by a complete stranger would have been something that Rust was used to, but as so often happened, uh, he was totally enraged. Rust drove the taxi past her, pulled up, got out, and went back to his favourite tactic. As the attractive young woman walked past him, he flashed her. This is something that had happened hundreds of thousands of times in Rust's life. He was expecting the usual sick thrill of Maya being repulsed by what he did. And Maya was a firecracker. She was a tough woman, no mood for, to suffer fools. So Maya looked at his shriveled genitalia and laughed. How would Rust respond to Maya's laughter? He'd never physically assaulted a woman on the street. He lunges towards her. The intention of grabbing her was just to have sex with her. Later that night, an anonymous call is made to the emergency services in Adelaide. A man has sighted a woman seemingly motionless in the grounds of a disused police station. There seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there, I'm not sure. The voice belongs to Mark Rust, a man who no woman would want to meet on a dark night if they knew how dangerous he was. Lurking deep and undiscovered inside Rust's mental and physical makeup, a medical disorder. One of the points that is made is that he suffered from something called Kleinfelter syndrome. Now, this is an extra X chromosome on a boy. So normally a boy have an X and a Y chromosome. This is XXY. The physical characteristics caused by Kleinfelter syndrome would make a young man very self-conscious. As well as shrunken genitalia, Rust would have had rounded hips, stunted growth, and an inability to reach sexual satisfaction when he wanted to. It was during these teenage years when the symptoms would be most obvious that Rust is first arrested and charged with indecency offences. He seemed to be in a state of almost permanent sexual need but wasn't necessarily able to get sexually aroused when he needed to. Rather than hide his condition away, Rust flaunts it. Masturbating in public or flashing people or exposing himself is his way of saying, this is who I am, like it or not. It is now the late 70s that Mark Rust's journey to becoming a serial killer begins in Wyala, South Australia. There, he lives parallel existences. There is Mark Rust, the sex pest. At the age of 13, he started following pretty girls around town, fantasizing about them. And there is Mark Rust, the apparently normal teenager, 
but never truly far from the surface, the menacing misogynist. So Rust starts to go out on dates. He starts to go out with girls, he has relationships, one after the other. The difference is that when they end, Mark Rust starts to hate these girls. Right there we see a decision to act upon his impulses. It's a far cry from adolescent fantasizing about a woman to actually physically uh, following them, which is a very menacing thing to do, and a measure of the extent to which he was uh, able to avoid empathizing with his victims. It is one thing to seek gratification by menacing sexual behavior, but it's another to gain pleasure from the pain inflicted on Rust's victims. That was his modus operandi. Very quickly he became obsessed not only with the sexual thrill, but with the revulsion thrill. It was a one-two punch for him. This distinction would offer an ominous insight into Rust's motivation. The experts at the Royal Adelaide Hospital who later interviewed Rust said that apparently he gained great pleasure from the reaction of the women that he exposed himself to, uh, again indicating his lack of empathy with their feelings and in fact deriving pleasure from the shocked, horrified reaction that he created in them. And to get that pained reaction as a man in his twenties now in Adelaide, Rust escalates his indecency. It's as if he's proud of his physical deficiencies. This was the history of the man who had spotted Maya Yakic when working his taxi route in Adelaide. The woman about to be his prey was herself not in a good place mentally. Maya Jakic was not a happy woman. She suffered from bulimia, an eating disorder, and she had a terrible, volatile relationship with her parents. In fact, uh, one day after a blazing row, she moved out. She moved to Glenelg and lived by the beach in Adelaide. Maya, diminutive but tough, got through the days after leaving her mother's home any way she could. It's not a cheap place to live, and it appears that Maya may have had to sleep rough at times. Witnesses saw near a service station, a campfire, bedclothes, pillows. It seems that she was living there out in the open air. Alone, vulnerable, and in clear line of sight of Mark Erin Rust. During a career as a sex offender, he has escalated his behaviour. He's indecently exposed himself committed public sex acts on himself. How far will he go that night on a busy road in Adelaide, South Australia? As night falls in the city, a woman alone is targeted by a sex pest. Maya Yakic has responded to Mark Rust's latest incident of indecent exposure by bursting into laughter. How much danger was she in? Was it to be her last laugh? As a regular user of the Paynham Road in this part of the city, Rust, the taxi driver, will have known that the police station there and the patrol HQ next door were now closed. There were no security cameras. Its grounds had become overgrown. Plenty of dark, shady areas hidden from view of those driving by. He grabs Maya, probably stifling her cries by putting his strong arm over her mouth. Rust is strong enough to overpower Maya. He pulls her into the overgrown police station grounds. Until this moment, his sex crimes have not involved physical assault. He tries to rape Maya. Again, uh, the urge to perform was there, but he was unable to do anything effective about it. Rust was furious. From the age of 13, one offence had led to a more serious offence, from flashing to public masturbation. Then, menacingly following young girls before carrying out his squalid offences, they were his prey. He, the predator. He would choose carefully his moments before offending. With Maya, he's taken the next step up his escalating scale of violent sexual crime. He's attacked. As he pins the terrified Maya to the ground, 
She unable to scream, he unable to rape her. The sex pest Rust chooses to get his thrills in the worst way imaginable. Rust flipped from being a pest to being a killer. Rust attacked Maya, set upon her, <laughs> killed her, and then dumped her body next to a disused police station, covered it over with leaves and branches, and left it there. With Maya, Rust's journey from pervert sex pest to killer is complete. He would later confirm he got a kick out of it. When asked by an Adelaide psychologist why did he kill, he simply replied, uh, because I did. Coldly discarded under leaves in the grounds of the disused police station, how long would the body of Maya Jakic lie undiscovered? The way the mind of Mark Aaron Rust worked dictated the next chapter of his ugly story. Mark Rust has been assessed by psychiatrists at length and on many occasions. Some believe part of his motivation is a desire to repulse by using the body that he feels is deformed. He gets pleasure from shocking people. It's been speculated that by hiding Maya's body, he has prevented himself from gaining pleasure, the satisfaction at the revulsion of his actions. Perhaps that's why he takes the next bizarre step. He called in the crime himself. Rust was denied his usual thrill of someone being repulsed by what he'd done. And still craving that, he had to find a way to achieve that goal also. And so he started trying to make contact with the authorities to have them find Maya's body. Rust walked to a nearby phone booth. Shortly after killing Maya, he made the first of two phone calls. Just walked past the old Maya police station. There seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there. I'm not sure. He would contact police anonymously via the Crime Stoppers number, calling in, telling them to look for a body. But there are other possibilities to explain his motivation for calling the police. Is he showing off? One can easily speculate that he was toying with the police, saying that I've left this body underneath your noses. And, and to, to leave the body near kind of two police buildings is in, in and of itself very telling. This is somebody that either wants to get caught or wants to show that he's, he's fearless, feels that he can never get caught, perhaps. Officers duly went to the scene. Was Rust observing them? We may never know, but if he's watching them, awaiting a thrill on seeing their reaction when discovering Maya's body, he's going to be disappointed. Her body went undiscovered. There seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there, I'm not sure. And in what can only be described as Keystone Cop's black humour, multiple attempts were made by police to find a decaying body by one of their own police stations, unsuccessfully. He tries another means of getting the authorities to find Maya's body. Having just killed half an hour before, he calmly drives to the Royal Adelaide Hospital. From a phone booth there, he calls the ambulance service. With such a vague, anonymous call, nothing is done. Tragically, Maya's body lies decaying in the grounds of the former police station for days. Frustrated that his behaviour has gone unrecognised, Rust tries again to tell the police where to find Maya's remains. Time and again, Rust would contact the police leave them some sort of anonymous message. At one point, he even tucked a note up underneath the windscreen wiper of a patrol car. Badly phrased grammar saying, there's a body next to the police station. You should go find it. Rust has some nerve. In the days following the murder of Maya, he's regularly on Paynham Road. He could have been spotted by those driving or walking past. But the exhibitionist was determined to milk his murderous moment. He actually returned to the scene of where he left the body for about five days before leaving the note there. So there was clearly a fascination with him for what he had done, coming back and forth and revisiting it. And then this culminating in, in what was in effect 
a confession, a note saying, this is what I did, this is what you'll find, without giving his name, of course. The note read, There's a dead girl's body in the shrubs of the grounds near the main road of the Paynham police station. This is no joke. Take a good look. The note would do its job. It's still impossible to say if Rust was cruising by, observing as patrol officers returned to the disused police buildings. Detectives believe he almost certainly was watching. That note sent the rookie patrol officers there. That note caused Maya's body to be found. The entire city of Adelaide was horrified by the discovery of Maya Jackic. He didn't have just one person horrified by what he'd done. He had a city now. Feeding off that emotion was like a drug for him. He was sated for a very, very long period of time. But unfortunately, it didn't last forever and three more women were going to pay. Police quickly formed the opinion that Maya's attacker had been sexually motivated, but they did not link her murder with Mark Aaron Rust, the sex pest. He was in the clear, still driving his cab, still on the prowl. Horrifyingly, nothing happened to Rust at that time. Rust wasn't caught. Rust wasn't even thought about as being in conjunction anywhere near Maya Jackic. Because again, though police knew about Mark Rust, he was a pest. He was that weird little monotone gnome looking guy that flashed people. He was the taxi driver that was a little bit handy. He wasn't a killer. Police never stopped and turned their minds to the thought that this man's behavior, which had been escalating since he was 13 years old, a clear pattern of worsening crime, might have taken the next logical horrendous step. Nothing was stopping Rust. He had exposed himself as a teenager. He had committed various lurid and obscene acts in front of women. He had even committed murder. Virtually all of his victims were women, and he cared nothing for their feelings. A misogynist murderer is at large in Adelaide. Sex-obsessed, despite his physical failings, he spots a woman at a bus stop. He sizes her up. A possible target. What's on his mind? He drives by, considering his options. Will he parade himself to shock or repulse? Does he have rape on his mind? Or has his offending threshold reached a point where only murder gives him the thrills that he craves? The young woman is oblivious to the threat posed by Mark Rust. Now he has killed. Is Mark Erin Rust about to kill again? Mark Rust is cruising Adelaide in his taxi, the perfect cover as he looks for the kind of thrills he's been getting from abusing women since he was a teenager. To Rust, a woman alone is a target. Amongst his favorite attack zones, bus stops, there he is spotted as prey. Framed against the neon lit shelter, the young woman can be seen from hundreds of yards away as Rust drives his cab. He might turn off the main road, weighing up whether it's too late to pounce, too many witnesses. In the distance, the girl sees her bus. She has no idea she's being observed, stalked. For her, another routine trip. For Rust, an opportunity. A typical episode of Rust's abusive life. This time he decides it is too obvious. He can walk away, come back another day, which he will, time and again. In the months following his murder of Maya Yakic, he's up to his old habits. Stopping near bus stops, flashing people, following young women around, making lewd comments or grunting in his characteristic monotone as they walk past. He just became a serial pest, someone that the authorities may have known about, but didn't consider to be a threat. Nowhere in Greater Adelaide was a woman safe. Out there, at any minute, he might attack. One girl at a bus stop had been lucky, another was not. He exposed himself to a woman, masturbated in front of her, and it must have been an appalling thing to witness. 
Was his behavior an indicator to police that he could be Maya Jakic's killer? He was considered, but not seriously. That's just Mark Rust. He, he might do a petty crime here or there, and he might flash at you, but he's nothing to worry about. He's nothing serious. But Rust was something serious. He'd been thrilled, excited, satisfied by killing Maya Jakic. But his warped sexual urges could not be kept in check now that he had murdered. Police knew Maya Jakic's killer was somewhere out there, but they did not have a single suspect, which allowed Rust to continue to go about his business. How would police eventually uncover the truth about Mark Rust? Though it would unravel too late to save more from becoming a victim of Mark Rust, indicators were emerging about his personality which police would one day find useful when trying to track down a serial killer. Evidence came from inside prison. Rust had been convicted for what some considered minor sexual deviancy, but his most severe sentence came in 1993, and it was for a completely different type of crime altogether. His first time in prison was for arson. He caused some half a million dollars worth of damage to a building in the Kensington area of Adelaide. When inside, he wrote letters to his family, mostly to a brother called Stephen. The letters would one day offer an important insight into the mind of Mark Rust. By being sent to prison, he's brought more shame on his family. He has a record over decades of perverted, sordid offences targeting women. Does he show some sort of remorse in the letters? He makes a point of, of really kind of minimizing it. He says, you know what, it's just going to upset you. You know, don't worry about it. Let's talk about something else. There's a real sense that um, he hasn't really taken on board the enormity of the pain that he's caused. That is totally self-centered. Uh, in about 20 lines, he's used the word I, I think, 14 times. And there is not a, a word of... Uh, sympathy for his victims. It is all I, 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 uh, Mark Rust, it is all that matters in this document. Rust's words had exposed the mind of a man who will always be a danger. This is the mind of a man who may never be capable of empathizing with another person, and certainly not a woman, for the rest of his life. The letters would one day also offer forensic investigators a telling piece of evidence against Rust. This letter is actually very important because it's the one that is used to, to compare to the note that was found on the car, basically alerting the police to what had happened. But that chapter of investigation into Mark Rust was still to be written. Having served his time for arson, Rust was released from prison. One evening, working again as a cab driver, he spots his latest target. Just before his second most infamous crime, Rust was looking for another victim. He was back on the streets and he needed a fix. There was a young woman on Goodwood Road who'd pulled up in her car to use an ATM. Rust jumped out, flashed her and tried his damnedest to sexually assault her. By whatever providence there is, this young woman managed to make it back into her car, lock the door, reverse back at high speed and get away from him. Not unnaturally, the young woman was deeply traumatised. Yet more evidence of a man who would act upon his urges, oblivious to the distress of his victim. She went straight home to her partner. They told the police. The police were on the hunt straight away for this person. At this point in the Mark Rust story, however, police did not know what he was capable of. The attack on the woman had been physical, not the style that had been associated with Rust. Nobody stopped to think that it might have been Rust because it didn't fit his MO. Rust, of course, flashed people as they walked past. He might follow them for a little while, but he didn't do things like that. So Rust wasn't looked at again, even though this man is fresh out of prison with a history as long as your arm of escalating sexual offending. Still, nobody thinks to look at him. The South Australian Police Department does not consider this man a threat. But he was a threat. The killer remained on the streets, worked his taxi trade, picking up women who were on their own whenever he could. His mind in the same sick, 
warped state which had motivated decades of sex crimes. The victim of his latest attack had been lucky to escape. He would not take long before deciding to attack again. Having had his intentions with that young woman frustrated, having missed out again on that thrill, Rust finds Megumi Suzuki. Megumi Suzuki is a student on the night of August 3rd, 2001. Nearly 5,000 miles from home, the Japanese student bought a SIM card for her phone from an Adelaide service station. She is oblivious to the danger that she's in as Rust comes across her. For Rust, Megumi was a perfect victim. She was a woman alone. She was comfortable in her surroundings. There was nothing to be frightened of. This was her new city. Megumi was a popular student and probably would have felt very secure. She's a young woman. She's in a country she feels confident in and comfortable in. Um, there's no reason to assume she would have felt wary of anyone around her. But Megumi had never come across the darkness of her mind, like Rust's. Her world was one of late nights at bars parties, friends. She had become close with a young South Australian. They'd met in Tokyo and he was a way of, of getting into the Adelaide life for her. This is a young woman who's in a new country, so having someone to reach out to who, who is there from her past would probably be a source of comfort. So she'd made it from her favourite shopping mall, Rundle, across to Goodwood Road. All we know is that Megumi went across Goodwood Road at one point to use the facilities at a petrol station. It wasn't busy around the service station where Megumi bought her SIM card, which made it easier for him to spot the young woman. Megumi, alone, tried to call her young friend 12 times, but he wasn't picking up. She headed for a ride home on a bus. Having been in Adelaide for nearly a year, Megumi had become familiar with the sights and the sounds of a city in which she felt safe. She said as much to her parents back home, who she regularly called. As she stood at the bus stop, Megumi wouldn't have been worried. There would have been no sense of anxiety. I mean, in the end, you know, Adelaide had become a home away from home. What was there to worry about? Mark Rust was just a few menacing feet away as Megumi looked down the road to see if a bus was coming. Megumi Suzuki has decided to go back to her student digs. She's not aware that Mark Rust has made her his latest target. He pulls her from the nearby bus stop. For whatever reason, likely sexually, he attacked Megumi. He drags Megumi to waste ground beyond the service station. He holds her down to rape her. It's not known if he succeeds, but Megumi's survival is in the balance. Based partly on snippets of information gleaned later from cellmates and on his modus operandi, investigators have pieced together what happened next. He says to Megumi, don't look at me. Now she mishears and turns around and does look at him and it's at that point that he decides to kill her. Did Megumi laugh at him? Did she react naively? Did she scream? And whatever happened sparked him over that same line as it did with Maya. Rust's behaviour is remorseless, without mercy. All we know is that Rust picked up a rock and beat her to death. Megumi Suzuki is probably unconscious as Rust delivers the fatal blow. He's a cold-hearted serial killer. Rust's contempt for his victim is compounded by what he does next. Rust murdered Megumi Suzuki and dumped her body in an industrial bin behind a set of shops. Megumi's body is left undiscovered. Her violent death was to be followed by an ignominious trail of events. For her family in Japan, months of mystery. Where had she gone? Was she somewhere in Adelaide having skipped college? At her university, volunteers manned search parties. Her student friends walked the streets, visited her favourite haunts. When Megumi vanished, 
police looked everywhere for her. They made public appeals for her to turn herself in. There were thoughts that maybe she had run away with a man, that maybe she was in hiding, that she was worried she'd ashamed her parents. And so there was a lot of hope out there that maybe she was still alive. There were sightings reported of her running around, people that looked like her, people that were close enough. Rust's contemptuous decision to dispose of her body in a rubbish bin added a grotesque, demeaning footnote to the life story of Megumi Suzuki. This is honestly one of the more horrific things that I've heard in my career. Megumi's body remained in that industrial bin unfound and was taken to the major dump outside of Adelaide. It would be many, many months before police realised they needed to look for her there. And then it was a matter of volunteers and police officers digging through hundreds of thousands of tonnes of garbage, section by section, to find her remains. In what would later become hugely important to the case against him, he did something else. Rust stole an item from Megumi's bag. Rust chose to take a CD player. He regarded it as a trophy. What part would it eventually play in his undoing? For now, with Megumi's body undiscovered, Rust was free to prowl the streets, to work his taxi rounds, and to attack again. The problem with serial killers is that nobody knows when they'll stop. How many are they going to kill? Every serial killer starts with their first victim, then they stop, and then they pick up again. So who knew if Megumi was the last? Another woman was to come face to face with Rust. It was this next attack which was to change the police's view of the serial sex pest. And so Rust went on the hunt one more time. He went back to the Paynham area, Kensington Road, found a woman who was working late in the business. Rust came in wearing a mask cut the power, cut the phone lines, and told her to get down and take off her skirt. She knew he had a knife, and she felt the best way of keeping herself alive was to submit. That takes, for me, indescribable bravery and strength of will to be able to survive that experience. Because she had managed to convince his trollish little mind that she was into it, that she was a willing participant in his sick game. He considered it sex, and so he let her live. That woman so narrowly avoided being the third person killed by Mark Rust. She also kickstarted the case against her attacker. His latest victim was not only brave, but she was resourceful. She managed to get a good look at the car and she managed to remember some of the numbers in the license plate. When she reported her assault, one of those number plates led police straight to Rust. And so for the first time, South Australian police paid attention to Rust and they realised, oh, here he is, he's progressed from a flasher to a rapist. Maybe we should arrest him. And so Rust was arrested for the sexual assault of that woman, for the rape of that woman. At last, police were getting serious about Mark Rust, not a sex pest, a sexual predator. But he was still not suspected of the murder of either Maya Yakich or Megumi Suzuki. Detectives in the Maya investigation decided on a new approach. They released the audio of the mysterious phone calls made on the night that she had been killed. There seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there, I'm not sure. Those phone calls were the way that the police finally managed to track him down. After working for years abroad, Rust's brother had returned to Australia. He watched the news, heard the recordings. Upon hearing this, Mark's brother, Stephen, gives up his brother to the police. Stephen Rust tells police that he thinks the man who had called from this phone box was his brother. Rust, by now, is behind bars for the rape of the woman who had seen his number plate. And there, another crucial piece of evidence would be found in the case against him. He was taken to the Port Augusta prison, which is far north of the city, 
When you go to Port Augusta Prison, you're allowed to take a few personal effects with you, given that you're going to be so far away from friends and family. Russ chose to take a CD player. It wasn't his, it was Megumi's. It was his trophy. And so while the public of South Australia, the media of South Australia, Megumi's parents, police, all consider Megumi to be a missing person, are trying to find her, are making public pleas for her to let people know where she is, thinking that maybe she's still alive, Rust is lying in his bunk in Port Augusta prison with headphones on, listening to music on his victim's CD player. Police were still in the dark about Rust's attack on Magumi. They remained focused on linking Rust to the murder of Maya Yakic and felt that recognition of his voice on the emergency service calls was not enough to prosecute. They needed more, and they were to get it, from an informant. Rust, the man who liked to repulse and shock, couldn't keep his mouth shut about his crimes. A fellow prisoner reported the conversations that he'd had with Rust. His cellmate was as appalled as anyone and went straight to the police to tell them. Rust was quite prepared to brag about anything to do with Megumi Suzuki. He was proud of what he'd done because now it was time for everyone to be revolted by him, well and truly. And then when they went to his cell, they found Megumi's CD, the one that Rust claimed was his own. Could police finally link the murder of Maya Yakic with the disappearance of Megumi Suzuki? On it, a serial number one Megumi's parents had a record of back in Tokyo. And that was the serial number of the CD that Megumi had bought for herself. The case against him was building up. Detectives get handwriting experts to compare the writing on Rust's letters with that on the note left on a police car after Maya's death. The writing is clearly from the same man. Despite at first denying involvement, he eventually confessed to killing both women. Maya was the straw that broke the camel's back and transformed Rust from a sexual pest into a sexual killer. For those following the story, Rust's eventual confession was no surprise. He enjoyed his moment in the spotlight. This was getting every pretty girl in Adelaide, every pretty girl in South Australia to be horrified by him all at once. Look what I did. I didn't just flash you, I killed you. I didn't just look, follow you around, I raped you. It was the ultimate sick thrill for him. It was the ultimate public exposure. Rust himself confirmed. It was two victims down, but more would have followed. Rust actually admitted that he would have killed again and again. If he hadn't been stopped, he would have killed even more women. He killed Maya because it was a thrill. He killed Megumi because he could. What would be his reason next time? The truth was he didn't need a reason. He had the taste for it now. He was a serial killer, just waiting for the next victim to come along. Megumi's family in the whole of Japan were devastated. A young woman on an adventure in Australia, a life of hope and happiness, ended by Mark Rost. You send your child out into the world and you expect them to have a good life. You want them to get a good education, to make something of themselves. You want them to be happy. Megumi's parents sent her to Adelaide because they thought that would be the best place for her to get a great start in life. It did the exact opposite. It took away her life. Rust would eventually receive the most severe sentence possible for the murder of the two women. Rust was sentenced to two consecutive life terms with no parole. It's very unusual in South Australia. And he was emotionless. He was absolutely implacable. He was listening as if he was listening to a TV show. There was nothing there. He also received 12 years for the rape of the woman who was lucky to escape with her life. But the Rust story was to take another twist in 2015 when he appealed against his original sentence. He wants to know if he ever will have the chance of parole. The point about the sentence is that it doesn't give Rust very much hope that he'll ever be released. He wants a sense of when things will end. And I think for a lot of prisoners, it's that uncertainty, more so than the amount of years it's more difficult to live with. But the hearings at the court suggest that Rust may never get his wish. 
the hearings that have been held have heard that Rust is known for attacking prison guards, that he's known for being belligerent and violent inside the prison, and claims that he's had privileges denied. Now, Rust denies all of this. He says that he's undertaken victim empathy courses, that he now has insight into his offending behaviour. He wants to rehabilitate, get out of prison and make something of himself before it's too late. I think one of the most salient comments came from the judge that heard the most recent application. She said that she's read absolutely nothing in all the volumes of reports that have been put before her that give her any hope that Mark Rust is capable of changing. Justice Anne Vanston has actually speculated that it is unlikely that the original psychiatrist will change his opinion on the report. I think she realised that the woman in pain and was lucky to escape with her life. I think she realised that the young woman at the ATM was lucky to escape any form of assault. And I think she realised that the next person that Rust encountered was going to die even more viciously and even more horrifically than Megumi or Maya. And if eventually Rust is denied his request to one day be eligible for parole, it won't surprise or disappoint psychologists. One of the things that came across very strongly is how he minimised what he'd done. He minimised the effect of exposure on women. He minimised the effect that it had on his family. He minimised the effect that it had on his victims. And given the letters that he sent through to his brother afterwards, after the crime, it seems like it's still something in his mind that perhaps wasn't that big of a deal. And that perhaps is one of the scariest things about him. <laughs> 